morning, everybody. Welcome to Second Service today, and thankful that you guys are here safe and sound. Last night I was uh, watching the radar on my phone and the radar on my iPad, and uh, went up to the attic at least three times, into the garage at least four times, uh, maybe like you, because when that, I'm not going to say my house got hit by 90 miles an hour, I will say probably 88 miles an hour. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I realized, wow. So been through that before, but on my radar, on both my iPad and my phone, you know, green, ah, green, blue, blue, yellow, uh, red, red, dark red. No, there's, before you get to purple, there's a dark red on my, and dark red is like, ooh, and then I saw purple, and the first time I've ever seen within the city of Amarillo, not just purple, but dark purple. Ooh. And then on my radars, I can see where my house is, and I live in City View, and I'm looking, and so I'm thinking, don't let that dark purple come here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I realized the dark purple was going over our church. Aren't you thankful we have a dry <laughs> seat this morning that <laughs> God is good? So uh, I'm just thankful, thankful that you guys are here, and we know what storms are like. Um, but just to remind you, church building or no church building, it, this ain't the church, it's just the building. And uh, we know what it's like to meet in a tent, so I'm glad we're not in the tent today. Um, but we, we'll do whatever we got to do. This is just a grocery store, that's all it is. And the church is actually you guys. And so thank you for uh, being here today. I appreciate that the church of the Lord Jesus come out. We're not the only church in town. We're just one of the ones. Uh, we are a local church. Uh, just to remind you, we are on the highest intersection in Amarillo. So this mountain right here, I, I love coming up to the mountain. I knew that we would not be flooded, but I feel sorry for the ones in the valley around us. So they got a lot of water last night. And uh, so here we are. And uh, we're not the best church in Amarillo. We're not. We're just a church in Amarillo. We are the best church at Western and Plains. <laughs> I guess only once. It's a bad joke. I've told it way too many times. But, you know, just to remind you, though, you're the church. The church is God's people. Uh, you might be a brand new visitor and say, no, I'm not joining this church. Well, great. Nobody does. We don't have church membership here. <laughs> you come here, you're part of us. That's the way that works. Um, if you know the Lord Jesus, you are part of the church, whether you wanted to be or not, if you know him. Now, if you don't know Jesus, that's a different subject. I hope you get saved today and you can be part of the church. But what I'm concerned about whether you're here for the first time or you've been with us for 34 years. There are people in the room that go back 34 years. Some people in the room go back with me even further than that to 38, 39 years. What I'm really concerned about is that if we're a healthy church, you know, I, I care about the church of Amarillo. Uh, Jesus has his way of looking not at local churches, but at city churches. So like the book of Revelation, you saw seven different cities and the church of Philadelphia, the church of Ephesus. He has a way of looking at like the church of Amarillo. Well, I don't, I don't control all of Amarillo, but we do got a spot right here. So I pray for the church of Amarillo. Desperately, I want the church of Amarillo, watch this, to be healthy. I just want it to be healthy. Don't you mean healthy, wealthy, and wise? No, I mean healthy, <laughs> biblically. Whether it's wealthy and wise, that's up to God. But no, 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 I don't buy into all that extra stuff. I, I do not believe in the health and wealth prosperity gospel. I don't, I, I don't. I, I think it's a different gospel. I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I want to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, I hope you are, but it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. It has to do with, you know. But I do want our church to be healthy. Locally, and I wanted to be healthy. That, that's actually what is happening in the book of Titus. Uh, let me preempt you a little bit. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Titus. We're going through this book. Today's the fourth sermon uh, in this book. It's on page 1463 of a seatback Bible, in case you don't have one. It's right there, or you can pull it up on your phone. But absolutely, you do not want to just take my word for it. You don't want to take my word for it. You're going to be mad at me if you think this is a sermon by Bill. 
But if it's a sermon by God and I'm only quoting the Bible, then when I kind of swear at you in a little bit, you'll say, no, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> hold on, hold on. It's one of those woolly booger sermons, but I didn't write it. I'm just walking through the word of God. That's what I love about the Bible. In a way, I can't get in trouble. I didn't write it. This is what God says, right? Right? So if I swear at you, I guess I do. See, I got your curiosity. Say, ain't no way you're... Depends what you call swearing. So what's the point? Well, the whole point in the book of Titus we saw three, now four sermons ago, the key verse, and I got it on a slide for you. Can I see chapter one, verse five? For this reason, that's the Apostle Paul talking to Titus. For this reason, Titus, I left you in Crete. That's an island of 30, 130 miles long in the Mediterranean Sea. So Paul left Titus on this island of Crete. Why? That you, Titus, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. You gotta, you gotta help these churches out. You gotta put in order the things that are still lacking. They're, they're out of order. So Titus, you, you need to do that. We, we saw four weeks ago, and I'll just remind you as we go through this book together, that key verse, there's actually a word that's used there to set things in order is a medical term. It's a medical term. It's only used one time in your Bible. But it means... Uh, Put the broken bones back into order. You need to set it in order. Or if there's a limb out of joint, I, I know what that's like with a shoulder that dislocated 30 times. I know what it's like for them to get that back. I, I want it to be in order. I want it to work. And so you don't want a broken church. You don't want an out of joint church. So the purpose of the book of Titus is to set in order the things that are lacking. By the way, I've done this for 34 years, it never gets finished. Because about the time you get this one arm back together again, the other arm's broke. About the time you think this is in order, well, somebody walks in and gets it out of order again. So job security, I got it. <laughs> we keep going back to the Word of God and setting in order, setting in order. Why? To have a healthy church. You mean to where we'll all be happy? No, healthy and happy don't always go together. Well, I just want to be happy. No, no, you need to have the right biblical diet. We saw that. Actually, three things we've covered already, and we got a slide for it. You need a healthy a biblical diet. You need biblical leadership and a biblical gospel. That's showing up in the first nine verses. So you want a healthy church, you got to have a, a healthy biblical diet. Well, I just like Twinkies and cupcakes. You'll be sick. No, we just want to hear how nice we are and how great we are and how much God is so in favor of us. Well, guess what? You won't be healthy with a diet just like that. You have to have the meat and the potatoes. You've got to have the full counsel of the Word of God. So we already saw in verse 4, that's why it's the preaching of God's Word, the whole counsel of His Word. You want a healthy church? Just preach the book. Go through the book. Make it, you know, applicable to wherever we are in the book of Titus. It's very easy because it's written to a church to be healthy. And so we're a church. We want to be healthy. So you're going to get a good meal today. How do you know? I'm just quoting the Bible, the Bible by itself. Preaching the Word of God, biblical diet. Oh, but you also have biblical leadership. Titus finds some pastors, bishops, overseers, and there's qualifications. You just don't take ones that are popular or ones that want to do it. There are categories. There's characteristics that they have to have. We saw that two weeks ago. It's in the first seven, chapter, or first seven verses, and there's qualifications that pastors need to have. Can you hear an amen? amen. Somebody says, oh, I just want to be a pastor. Well, great. Let's go through the list. Oh, I don't want to be a pastor anymore. <laughs> Matter of fact, I got some personal counsel for you before you want to be a pastor. You better make sure that's God's calling your life. Because there's a big old bullseye on your back. And sheep bite. But that's another sermon. Another sermon. Healthy church, healthy church, what is it? You've got biblical diet, biblical leadership, and you have a biblical gospel. Saw that last week. This is a trustworthy word. 
This is a faithful word. We're going to hang on tightly, a grip around the word of God. It's the gospel of God. The Lord Jesus very specifically. So you want to know the subject of this book? It ain't you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. How much God the Father loves you with his son. That happened on a tree. That's why we're going to celebrate communion today to remind you it's not really about you. It's about him. It's about him and how much he loves you. So you got to keep that kind of in order or else you'll think that you're like special. You're not special, except God died for you. And in Christ, you very much so are. That's why we keep coming back to his table. And so in about three hours, we're going to have communion. I just lied. It'll only be two hours. Okay. Just giving you a chance to breathe in the goodness of God. Biblical diet, woo, that sounds good. Biblical leadership, yeah, we understand that. A biblical gospel, okay. Are you ready? You're not gonna like it. Nobody's gonna say amen. No, tell us, Pastor Bill, tell us. Well, maybe we'll just go home now and be happy. Okay, I'm a little ahead of myself, but I'll do it anyways. Today, the fourth point. Can I see the next slide? Biblical rebuke. How to deal with false teachers. Pastor Bill, we don't like the word rebuke. I've never met anybody that likes the word rebuke. <laughs> but it is a biblical term. And if there's any false teachers or false prophets in the room or even on the radio, hang on, this one's for you. <laughs> As we walk through the word of God. Don't you love the word of God? I love it. I'm just picking up where we left off last week. So. Uh, Titus chapter 1, for our scripture reading today, I'm going to have you stand in respect to the Word of God. Picking up in verse 9, that's where we left off last week. Picking up in verse 9, the Word of God says this, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able both, that he may be able by sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, teaching, both to exhort and convict, ESV says the word rebuke right there, to those who contradict. Verse 10, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of filthy lucre, dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them sharply, that they may be healthy, sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Father, thank you for your word today. Your word. I pray that I would not overemphasize or miss any point or underemphasize anything that you bring out. May we understand what it means to rebuke them sharply. And so, Lord, I just give, not that I have to give you permission, I welcome the presence of Jesus Christ. I welcome the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the authority of your word. And as my brothers already prayed, I pray all the ones that need encouragement, instruction, and uh, edification, Lord, I thank you that your word accomplishes that. And also, Lord, others that they, they just might need the fuel and the energy to get through another week. Some might need conviction to receive Christ as their Savior like we had in first service, Lord. If there's anyone lost, Jesus, would you just show up 
and call them by name. Lord, I I don't know of a false teacher sitting here or even on the radio. I I don't know. But if there are any out there, Lord, I pray today they would be rebuked sharply. And all of us, Lord, I don't know where you're gonna reprove or rebuke or encourage. I trust your word to accomplish that. So we just yield ourselves, Lord, and how complicated our lives are to you. And we trust the gospel of Jesus Christ today, not only with our salvation, Lord, but with our sanctification and our service. That, Lord, as we come together right now, it's the gospel that accomplishes this for us. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that happened on that tree. I pray that today as we remember your body and your blood and the victory that you had and the energy you give to us and the power, Lord, the destiny of where we're going to heaven, all of that, Lord, not only that we would remember that, but we'd get ready, Lord, for our future because of it. So we thank you that this is all about Jesus Christ. So please come here, Lord. We do invite you, Holy Spirit, that you might anoint us, that the word of God would speak to us practically and individually as we look at a healthy church today. We thank you that Jesus would receive all the honor and all the glory. He's the only one that's worthy, God's people would say. Okay, everybody, please keep your Bibles open, especially on this sermon. Make sure that what I tell you is in the Word of God in the context of that chapter according to the whole council. That's always the formula. You should always use, whether you're listening to me, anybody on radio, any book you're reading, you want to make sure you're not listening or reading a false prophet. You say, well, they use the word gospel. Lots of people use the word gospel. There's the whole prosperity gospel thing out there. I don't believe any of it. I don't. I don't believe it's biblical. Well, they use parts of the Bible. I know they use parts of the Bible, but they don't use all the Bible. They don't. Oh, come on, Bill. You don't want to be divisive. I just want to be accurate. Last week, I told you about breaking my nose the first time. Playing football. I was way too skinny, way too young. And uh, I was in ninth grade. It's amazing how some boys already turn into men when they're ninth grade. I was a boy that stayed a boy for a long time. And so they put me through one of these things called the meat grinder. Guess what got ground up was me. Busted nose, blood everywhere, brain concussion, off to the doctors I go. And uh, so he told me, yeah, you broke your nose. You have a brain concussion. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, so that was number one, ninth grade. I didn't tell you about number two. Number two, I was 18 years old in Bible college and decided I would try to play basketball. Had never played basketball before, not like on a team. And so when the ball goes up, I know you got to go up and get that ball, like on a rebound. But what nobody had ever told me is that when you go up too late, other guys are coming down. So I'm going up, and this other guy, who was like a man, was coming down. And his elbow, coming down, hit me right there on the nose. So I went down. I could sing you a song, but I don't want anybody to get sick. Off to the hospital I go. See, I had this funny thing. I didn't even have to look, but trying to look toward Dumas, I was somehow looking toward Claude. (laughs) My nose was broke bad. So they took x-rays. And they said, you need to go see a specialist tomorrow. This is on a Thursday. Okay. And so I walked around for a night looking at Claude. (laughs) Man, it really hurt. It really hurt. And uh, so then I found the specialist on Friday. It's only been broke like, you know, 20 hours or whatever. And so the specialist looks at it, he says, well, before I figure out how I'm going to fix that, he said, I need to see the x-rays. And the hospital hadn't sent them over yet. So he said, we got time. We got time. Why don't you come back on Monday? 
and I'll fix it after I see the x-rays. Got it. Got it. I'll tell you the rest of that story in the middle of this sermon when I broke it for the third time. You say, why are you telling us that story at all? Because sometimes when you put it back in place, sometimes when you get rebuked, it hurts. A lot. See, the goal of the sermon, the goal of the sermon is actually in verse 13. We just read it, but let me look at that carefully before we put the points together. Verse 13, it's the goal of the sermon, if I said the, the goal of rebuking, because the, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, verse 13. Therefore, it's the big therefore of the whole paragraph. Therefore, with that being true, rebuke them sharply. These false teachers, these false prophets, rebuke them sharply. I'll tell you what uh, the sharply is in just a moment. But rebuke them, rebuke them sharply, sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. You don't rebuke them to crucify them. You don't rebuke them to throw them away. You rebuke them with the hope that they'll be healthy in the faith. So when you sharply rebuke somebody that's just flat out wrong, you're actually hoping it'll stick and that they'll repent, that they'll be healthy in the faith. Do you see? That is the goal. I wish that happened every time, but it doesn't happen every time. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But it, it, that should always be the goal. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. So rebuke shows up twice in this paragraph. It showed up once in the scripture reading. What does that word actually mean when you rebuke somebody, let alone if you rebuke them sharply? What what does it mean? So just to make sure we're on the same page, I I, I looked it up yesterday. Did you know the word rebuke means to rebuke? (laughs) Reprove. To convict. To refute to find fault with, to correct, to reprehend severely, to chide, admonish, reprove, to call to account, show one his fault, demand an explanation. And you guys look like you're in trouble. I'm just telling you the definition of the key verse to the whole paragraph and actually what happens every time somebody preaches the word of God. See, I I never have to go find a rebuking sermon. The word of God does that all by itself. I don't sit down and think, well, last week we were pretty positive, so this week let's be a little more negative. I don't ever think that way. Well, last week I built them up, this week let's just tear them down. I don't ever think that way. I just say, where did I leave off? Where am I going to pick up and go, oh, no. (laughs) This one's not going to be boring. I have never met a person yet that likes to be rebuked. Oh, I just love it, Pastor Bill. (laughs) You're a weirdo. (laughs) Nobody likes to be corrected. But aren't you glad that we have a God who tells us not only how much we have the option to have his son to have salvation, but often he rebukes us to get us to his son. Then in his son, even though all things are taken care of, then the word of God encourages and rebukes, reproves, builds up. It, It just keeps doing that. So, Specifically, this sermon is after the false teacher. But since we're all sitting here, can I tell you somewhere in the sermon, I'm sure you're going to get rebuked just like I have. That's just the way the Word of God works. But specifically, this is to correct severely false teachers and prophets that somehow they end up at Grace Church. Now, I don't know of any yet So all the visitors here, thank you for coming. We just believe you came for the right reasons. But we'll find out 
as time goes on. So you have a biblical rebuke, how to deal with false teachers, the goal. Let's look at the benefits of healthy teaching. We saw this last week, so we can cover it pretty quick. The benefits of healthy teaching, verse 9, we were there last week. So here's what pastors do. They hold fast, they get a grip of the faithful word, the trustworthy word, the biblical gospel. They, they hold fast, they don't give up on that, they don't let go of it. Hold fast, the faithful word as he's been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, by healthy teaching. Here's what pastors do. They hold on to the word of God and by healthy teaching, sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convict. ESV says rebuke. Both to exhort, build them up, convict them where necessary, rebuke those who contradict. So the benefits of healthy teaching, the benefits of of just going through the word, guess what? Healthy teaching produces healthy results. Oh, and healthy teaching also does this. It starts to convict convict to rebuke, excuse me, and to reprove the ones who are against it. You don't know they're against it until they get here. But not, not everybody's healthy that walks in here. Not everybody understands the full counsel of God's word when they walk in here. So one of the benefits is as I give out healthy meals, just the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, you know, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, it starts to work. You know, people that have been with us three decades, 34 years, they know what this book's about. You say, well, how do they know? Because I've fed it to them for three decades. You say, well, that's going to take a long time. Well, it doesn't take three decades to catch up. So by the way, by the way, I get to feed you one, maybe two meals a day. You say, well, that's all we need. You're a skinny Christian. (laughs) If you're only eating one, two meals a day, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, that's why, yeah, this has to do with our church, everybody, Church of Amarillo, I, I understand all that. But really, it also has to do, deal with you. This church is only as healthy as its individuals. So let me tell you, I, I really believe that most of the people in Grace Church, they actually listen to things on their phones sermons. They actually watch sermons. They actually read their, there's people that actually read their Bibles with me. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. And all of that produces more health. There's people that actually read good books that they're a little leery of just reading any book, but they want to know and they're growing. So all together, but this has to do with you as an individual, as well as with us as a group. That's the benefits of healthy teaching, healthy teaching, sound doctrine. That's not boring. That's where we live. The characteristics of false teachers, verse 10. We also saw this last week. So we hold fast the faithful word as we've been taught that the pastors that Titus is going to find, that I have the chance, may be able by healthy doctrine, healthy teaching, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially of the circumcision. We saw that last week, but today I want to, you know, these are the guys that don't have the healthy teaching yet. They don't have the sound doctrine. And so there's people on the Isle of Crete that are going to come and visit these churches. There's people that are insubordinate. They're idle talkers, empty talkers. They're deceivers. The the word there for insubordinate is rebellious. Uh, Another way to look at that word, they're not submissive. They want it my way. And so somehow they ended up here at times. They're they're empty talkers. That's the next point, Patricia. Watch it, it'll come up. There it goes, just like that. Oh, they talk a lot about stuff that doesn't mean anything. And then they're deceivers. Patricia? Yes. (laughs) 
the characteristics of false teachers. Is that in your Bibles? I'm not making it up, am I? Oh, so glad I'm not making it up. Because when we started our church, that was pretty easy. A bunch of kids, 29 years old. We'd been a Bible study, you know, for four years or so, and we had the opportunity in a gas station, started a church, Grace Church. Uh, we really didn't know what we were doing, except we did know we we're going to follow this book. You know, follow this book. And so there's 17 of us, all about 30 years of age, having babies, all that kind of stuff. And so we started this little, and everything was great because we had already been together for four years. We knew we loved the Lord and we loved the Word and we loved Jesus. And we were all, there wasn't a false teacher amongst us. There wasn't a deceiver because we knew each other. And then we started getting visitors at Grace Church. Did you know there's different reasons why visitors come? Did you know that? Well, I'm sure they're coming just to hear the sound teaching, the healthy food that we're giving. I'm sure they're coming just to you know, participate in, in a church that wants to just love the Lord. I'm sure they're coming just to help us. Well, most of the visitors, that's exactly, you know, some of them got saved and some of them needed a place and some needed a church. But did you know we got, we got people that had different agendas? No, you're coming for the Bible, right? You're coming for Jesus. Well, that's what they'll tell you, but that's not their agenda. You can't believe the different agendas that visitors have. Now, any visitors, they, don't take that personal because I know everybody came here just to love Jesus more and you just want a good church, everything. Fine. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And that's what we believe until we start listening to a bunch of your empty talk. Blah, 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 blah. What are you selling? Blah, 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 blah. And then it can go all these stories and all this stuff and all these things. And they'll say, whoa, whoa. Yeah, and I'd like to do a Bible study. A Bible study about what? Blah, 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 blah. Huh. Lots of, lots of talk. Where, where are you from? Well, this place made me mad, so I came over here. I can't get, you know, oh, you're a big fish looking for a small pond. Huh. I learned all this stuff over 34 years. And then I know this is hard to believe, especially for everybody here out of the right mode. I know you are, and everybody on radio. But did you know there's actually deceivers? You're just selling something. You're selling some kind of formula, some kind of doctrine, some kind of something. Or you're looking to hit on somebody. Woo, I watched that one. Did you know some people are only coming to church to find somebody else? Really? Now, you're not a wolf, are you? Because wolves can be in sheep's clothing. Where'd you get that from? Jesus. You see, it's hard to be a pastor. And so I, I don't know that when people come in. Everything was fine when there were 17 of us in one place. But then all of a sudden there's 40 and then 80 and then 100. And now there's like, there's 2,500 people call this place home. And we got to make sure that they're not a false prophet or teacher or deceiver or conniver or wolf. I told you it was going to get to be a woolly bugger. I told you straight up. I already told you the key verse and the goal. In case God starts talking to any of you, just listen to God. Repent, enjoy communion, and follow Jesus. I told Cindy while we were doing worship, I said, as far as I know, everybody in this room loves us. But that might not be true after the sermon. <laughs> oh, Bill, just let it go. I can't. You want a healthy church? then you need to understand there's rebellious, empty talkers and deceivers trying to get in here all the time. Whether they want a girlfriend or a boyfriend or your money or somehow to shove their doctrine down your throat. 
I love you guys. That's the characteristics of false teachers. Well, what do you do with them? Verse 11. Oh, let me read verse 10 again. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. That would be the Judaizers, the legalists. We learned all about that in the book of Galatians. Especially those guys whose mouths must be stopped. What do you do with false teachers? Whose mouths must be stopped. Grace Church, am I quoting the Bible in the context of what it says? Whose mouths must be stopped. Is that what your Bibles say? And don't be afraid. Yeah. You know what that is in our lingo today? Shut them up. Shut up. Do I can't put that on a slide? Shut them up. You say, where'd you get it from? Right, right there. Just look at whose mouths must be stopped. They need to be silenced. Well, they got a right to free speech. In my parking lot, you can do anything you want. In this room, in a home Bible study, if you represent Grace Church at all, then it has to be by the book and nothing but the book. Focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I could also make this book say anything I want. Here a verse, there a verse, everywhere a verse, verse. Old McDonald. We are not old McDonald's here. We're following Jesus Christ. Period. Why do you need to shut them up? What well, tells us in verse 11? Whose mouths must be stopped. Why? Who subvert whole households. I realize that back in the early church, they didn't have buildings, they, had, they met in homes. You know what a false prophet wants to do when he gets in here? He wants to have a home Bible study. He wants to have a group somewhere. Then he wants to slip in, whether it's the filthy lucre part or deception part or agenda part, but he, he wants to subvert households. Why should we shut their mouths? Teaching things which they ought not. Teaching things which they ought not. There's, they teach strange things. They have dishonest motives. Not only do they teach strange things, things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. King Jimmy, Jimmy says, filthy lucre. They actually want dishonest gain. Money's driving it somehow. Not, not all of them. Not everybody wants money. Some of them want a gain of popularity or power. But money's behind a lot of it. And so you just always have to beware. Why? Because that's what Titus has to look out for on the island of Crete. And we're not on the island, but we're in Amarillo, Texas. And we also have to be careful to make sure, make sure. And so as you listen to people, usually they don't walk in here and wave all their banners and all their stuff on day one. Usually it takes some time. Because when they first show up, everybody's going, look at that guy. Isn't he great? He's a perfect family. Like when we're back at the Y and we're all 30-year-old kids and this guy walks in and he's an old man. He's all of like 55. When you're 30, you think I'm already old, but I get that. I, I do remember. So we're at the YWC, I mean, old building. There we are. This guy walks into the Y. He's got the full-blown suit on, the full-blown, I mean, right down the white shirt and blue tie. The guy is like Billy Graham or something. You know, like, look at him. And my whole church. And then on his arm, he's got his wife. And she's all dressed like she came to church. And we're a bunch of kids that say, hey, look at God sent us some real Christians. <laughs> and they walked in, and she's on his arm. And he had the biggest black King James Bible you've ever seen. Leather, complete leather, just right there. And I, I still remember the whole church. Went, Whoa. We got a legitimate visitor next to Elwood Park. Whoa. <laughs> Why would he come? He could be in any church in town. Why would he be in our church? 80 people with nothing. I don't know. Maybe he'll fill out a visitor card. We had cards back in the day. We couldn't print them. We couldn't print anything. We had nothing. 
So you, you could actually buy your visitor card from the Bible bookstore. And so we bought, and on that visitor card, it had this thing, would you like a visit from the pastor? Which implies you're gonna say yes or no. I'll never forget, we got his card back, and his card said this, I will never forget it. This was like 33 years ago. On his card, would you like a visit from the pastor? Here was his answer, if God so wills. Is that a guilt trip to me? Are you throwing something down I don't know? If God so wills, what, what kind of answer is that? Now, if you're a hyper-Calvinist, that's a great answer in the sovereignty of God. By the way, I believe completely in the sovereignty of God. I mean, who's in, who's in charge? God's in control. But I also believe in the free will, the responsibility of man. So do you want me to come see you or not? If God's so well, you're going to blame God if I don't come and see you or that I couldn't hear God? Or... So I went to visit him. I went to visit him. I guess God willed it. I'm not making it. Literally, there are dozens and dozens of stories I could tell you in 34 years. This, this is one of the top ones. He, he lived in Puckett. Whoa, I don't know anybody else that lived in Pocket. He lived in Pocket. He had a really nice house. I mean, it had just been painted, all that kind of stuff. I walked in, and it was like, wow, wow. And he's still all dressed up, pictures on the wall. And then I saw his books. He had all the same books I had in my library. And I thought, hey, this guy, I think he knows what he's talking about. And then I find out he worked for one of the greatest, greatest Men of God of the last century. Uh, Bill Bright changed the course of the church in the sense of Campus Crusade. If you know anything about Campus Crusade, that was started by Bill Bright. His right-hand guy came to our church dressed up in a suit. How come you're not still with Bill? I, you got all the right books? My church already loves you. I guess it was God's will for me to be here. And he said, I got to tell you something. What? I'm one of the two witnesses of the book of Revelation. <laughs> what? He said, I am one of the two witnesses of the book of Revelation. Well, you need to know, just in case you guys, you know, I believe in the book of Revelation. I believe there will be two witnesses. They could actually be alive today. I, I don't know, but they could be. And I'm, man, stuff's going to happen. If I, I mean, they, a lot of stuff's going to happen with those two guys. I mean, they really are there. And I got one of them coming to my church next to Elwood Park. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you can look at that as a compliment. Wow, I guess we really are something. <laughs> or the guy's whacked. Why would you ever, I'm telling you, he really believed it. He really believed it. You know what happened the next Sunday? He came back, all dressed in a suit. And all my people go, ah. <laughs> I know something you don't know. <laughs> well, how long will he believe that? He believed it. I used to, matter of fact, I'd say, okay, do something. I'll, you know, just do something. It's not my season. Well, when it is, call me. I'll come over. Like, prove it, bucko, if you're one of them. <laughs> I was in his house one time, and he said these words. Because he, he was not an idiot. He wasn't crazy. He was a false teacher. He said these words. I am that I am. Okay, you're going to get leprosy or be struck by lightning, <laughs> and I just want to walk out of here, knee out of here. On, I literally got down on my knees and said, you are not Jesus Christ, you're not God, and I'm done. You think I'd be making this up. I've got dozens of stories. This would be one of the more extreme. What do you do with a guy? Shut him up. I'd like to do a home Bible. Never. Lead a prayer meeting. Nope. We were still at the Y. 
I had a man on my board. His son-in-law was their worship director. His daughters and daughter-in-law helped teach our children and everything. And He went messianic, beyond messianic. I've seen this wave come through our church at least five times, at least five times in 34 years. People get caught up with Israel. They want to be Jews and then start doing all the Jewish stuff because then we'll get rich. We'll be blessed if we bless them. Now, if we have a visitor, you know, I love Israel as much as you can love them. Their flag flies in our mall area. I am down, down, down blessing Israel. Unless you do it to get ahead somehow. Unless all of a sudden it's got to be Saturday and you can't eat that and then you got to be circumcised, you got to purify. I've been there, I've done that with five different waves. Each wave takes dozens of people out of this church. So originally I go to my friend, my friend in his office, a board member, and I said, We got to talk. What about the New Testament and all that? I don't believe in the New Testament anymore. You don't. You helped start this church. What about the Lord Jesus? I don't believe in Jesus anymore. You don't. What about the Holy Spirit? I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I walked him through. What about the Old Testament? I don't believe in the Old Testament anymore. What do you believe? The first five books. The first five books. Alone. Hey, by the way, <laughs> you're not Jewish. He knew that. That's why they started a cult, and I'm not afraid to use the word cult, 34 years ago in this town called the Children of Noah. And that has sucked people right out of this church going back 33 years. And then along comes another wave and another wave and another wave. And every time it takes my heart and somehow my stomach and just pulls it through. These are people I know and love that somehow forgot about healthy, full counsel teaching of all the scriptures focused on Jesus. Thinking that maybe if we just, what, don't have a pork chop, you'll be more loved by God? One of the most powerful men that ever came into our church. Influential men. Smart. Ended up in the same, not children of Noah, there's lots of different names for, but the same thing. They, they want to be a Jew. You're not a Jew. He sacrificed a goat in his driveway for Passover and invited me to the meal. I told him I felt sorry for the goat. I do. My Jesus died so we don't have to go find a goat. And by the way, if you want to remember, well, at least go to United and buy it and not kill it in your driveway. And all the neighbors going like, that guy is weird. I just need a witness. I could call him my wife, but nobody would believe my wife because she's married to me. No, I mean it in this sense. If I said, Cindy, is that true? But it, just to kind of, you know, I, I did this with Carla Banks in the first service. Uh, Dennis Clowns, all the stuff I'm saying, is that true? Oh, Betty McCutcheon's back there. Betty McCutcheon, you know that it's true, don't you? Betty, Betty's been with me longer than you, Dennis, so um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Betty McCutcheon, I'm not hyping this story, I'm not exaggerating the story, and everything I just said cost her friends and family and church. That, that's why when people come, and by the way, you guys keep watching me. You don't know if I'd get weirded out by something. I know I'm not one of the two witnesses. I hope I am a witness. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, I am not the I am. I am not. I am not. And I'm not leaving the church, Holy Spirit, or the Word of God for nothing. 
whether it's popular or not. Watch this, whether it works or not. Don't go by, well, that doesn't work anymore. I don't care if it works, that's God's plan. That's God's plan. If that gets me in prison upside down on a cross, that's God's plan. And I'm not, I'm not leaving it. I'm not. I'm not. And healthy people, healthy church knows that. So when God, somebody shows up, whether he's hitting on somebody, bringing somebody, wanting somebody's money, starting a company, selling Tupperware, building houses, selling houses, I've seen it all. Nothing against you, Tom Roller. You're legit. But... <laughs> Oh, haven't we seen them? Filthy lucre, and they, we need a Bible study. No, you don't. No, you don't. You guys are doing pretty good. We're going to have communion. Rebuke them sharply is the command of the passage. The command of the passage. One of them, verse 12, a prophet of their own. So here's a proverb that came up somehow on the Isle of Crete. Cretans are always liars. Now, it's one thing if somebody calls you a liar, but you're always a liar. Evil beast. It's another thing if somebody says, you're a beast. <laughs> but they say, you're an evil beast. A lazy glutton. It's one thing to be called a glutton, but a lazy glutton, man, that's like... I'm glad. I don't think Amarillo has that tag. I'm glad. We might be rednecks or whatever, but at least we're not that. And then Paul, though, that was a proverb about these people on the Isle of Crete. Paul says this testimony is true. What? <laughs> yeah, they're a bunch of evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and they're always lying. I mean, that summarizes the island. At that, Titus should have said, I want a different job. <laughs> Can I tell you, isn't it amazing the gospel of Jesus Christ can save a lazy glutton? Isn't that great? Man, I've seen more lazy gluttons come in here, and guess what? God can save them. Beasts. Man, I've seen evil beasts come in here. You know what I love about that? The gospel of Jesus Christ can save any beast, especially evil beasts. They don't have to be evil anymore. This church is full of liars. Every one of us. Are we always lying? I hope not by the grace of God. Isn't it great that God's grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, can save liars like you and me and beasts like you and me? That's the power of the gospel. But what do you do with a whole group of false prophets like this? This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them severely. Rebuke them abruptly. It's a command. Rebuke them. Correct them that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Put it back in order. Fix it. Straighten it out. Rebuke them. They're not going to like it. It doesn't matter. It's going to hurt. Fix it. My nose was already broke. I'm seeing the dude on Monday to put it back so I'm not looking at Claude anymore. Proof that 18-year-olds can go brain dead really quick and forget that their nose is broke. Because Cindy and I decided to play volleyball Sunday afternoon. There wasn't a volleyball there, so we used a soccer ball. Before you know it, we've got two teams, and my roommate is three feet in the middle of the net on the other side. And when I say a floater, you know, a floater, soccer ball, picture this, going up, it's going to go on one side, so I decide to block it, both hands up, and my roommate, his name was Joe Jock. Spiked that soccer ball, and my schnauz is already broke. <laughs> Two downs. I cannot communicate the pain. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
When I saw the specialist the next day, he said, I don't need the x-rays because now you're looking at Lubbock. <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. Well, put me under. Make me go to sleep. He said, no, we're going to have to fix that. And I will not tell you what he had to do for me to be sharply rebuked. Did it hurt? Did it fix it? I'm just glad I can look at Dumas today. <laughs> and, yes. Was it worth it? Huh? That first man that thought he was one of the two witnesses never had a Bible study, didn't lead a prayer meeting, but for the next 20 some years was a part of our church. We had to watch him. And his wife died. And he got really sick and, and he died. Our friends that went and started whatever they started, and Betty and I know now that that was 28 years ago or whatever. There's no fruit from it. And marriages and kids and grandkids and stuff. Did you know uh, two of those family members were in our first service today, Betty? And I watched them come back after 20 some years. We've had all kinds of people, you know, get mad, think they're right or whatever. They go off and try to do their own thing. But the beauty is you'll know them by their fruit. And sometimes you just have to watch. That's why, watch me, watch me. Don't just, because I stand here today. I got 39 years invested into Amarillo. So either it's good fruit or it's not. I know I'm not perfect, but I know this book is. I know the Lord Jesus can save anybody, even a liar like me. So yeah, we, we test every visitor every time somebody comes back, and it's not like they get a test. But we listen, we watch. Are you still a deceiver? Are you still a false, empty talker? Are you still rebellious? Or has God changed your heart? Yeah. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. You see, there's a distinction the gospel makes. To the pure, all things are pure. You know, I, in the context of that verse, I don't worry about food. I don't worry about what day I worship. I don't worry about purification rites. That's what was messing up these people. You see, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, detestable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. There's a difference the gospel makes. And all your legalists out there and all your empty talkers out there, all your false prophets, they, they might profess to know the truth, to know God, but their lives don't back it up. Can I, can I just remind you that to the pure, all things are pure. In other words, you can enjoy life because of Christ, the way he sets you free. You can actually, oh, don't let me offend anybody, but if you're offended, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a cheeseburger later, a bacon cheeseburger. You can't put cheese and burger together. Well, I can. Maybe you can't, but I can. And bacon on, you can't do that. Well, I can. No, 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 no. Well, I'm not saying I'll do it in Jerusalem when I'm walking down the street with Gila, but in Amarillo, Texas? Well, why do you say that? Can I see uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 7, real quick? Jesus said to them, Are you thus without understanding? Also, do you not perceive that whatever enters into a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter into his heart, but his stomach, and is, elimini is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Can I hear you say all foods? All. Enjoy some shrimp. I don't like shrimp. Well, then don't enjoy it. Well, I'm going to tell everybody you can't eat shrimp. No, don't do that. 
You see, to the pure, all things are pure. In other words, what Paul is saying here, enjoy your freedom with Jesus. That doesn't mean you can do anything you want. It does not mean that. But it means like you don't have to get caught up in all the rules and the ridges and the things and you're not doing right. That's what false teachers do. Remember what we saw in Galatians chapter five? We saw this key verse. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't get there. Enjoy the Lord Jesus and the freedom that he's given us. That, see, that's one reason. We don't do church membership. Why do you, that's another form of manipulation in my brain. It is. It is. You're either part of the church or you're not. Healthy diet, healthy food, healthy life. Christ. Now, the guys that are out there, the false teachers, notice, in contrast to that, but those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. They're never happy. They're never satisfied. They're always looking to get more. But even their mind, even their mind and conscience are defiled. That word defiled means to die, to stain, to pollute. Their minds are polluted. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him being detestable, abominable, disobedient, disqualified, worthless, not approved for every good work. I've done this enough to, to watch some of the false teachers and false prophets when they get to the end of their lives. They're never happy. They're never free. Are you? Our church is. Our church is as healthy as it's ever been. I, I can say that. You can look at any category. I'm not looking at statistics. I'm looking at the way we love one another, the unity of our church, the love for the, the word. It's never, it's never been as healthy as it's now. I had the privilege of meeting Nate's mom and dad, and that's exactly what I told him before the service. Nate's coming into us. It's a, it's a beautiful season right now. Our interns are back, you know. We got young people come here. I am way too old to have young people in this church. <laughs> Statistically, aren't you glad that everybody's not 63 years old in this church? I am. Whoa, that would be a drag. <laughs> so why is, why is Nate still? You're only 18. Are you 19 now? You're 19. Oh, 19. He's 19. He said it like that. I'm 19. <laughs> I told his mom and dad, it's a great time for him to come. It's, there, there's a great unity in our church. Now, don't you guys mess it up. And don't you mess it up. Don't let me mess it up. You see, there's a lot of people, and I think they show up here every once in a while. Verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him. I know that's talking about the false teachers, but there's a lot of people. I mean, everybody in Amarillo professes to know God. Everybody does. Well, it's one thing to profess that you know God. It's another thing to possess the God that died for you. Can I see Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We understand that verse. We've looked at it many times. But, but if I said, hey, it's a gift of God, it's a gift of God, it's a gift of God. Does everybody believe that? Amen. So all of you can, you know, profess that. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, but do you possess it? If it's a gift, you have to receive the gift. You have to take it inside your house. You have to open it up. You have to put it on. You actually receive Christ. You just don't like, well, I know he existed. No, 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 that's not, that's not the same. Well, I, I'll confess him. Well, I, I'm glad you're confessing, but do you, have you received him? Because once he's in you, and the new creature, creation is in you, and the power of the Holy Spirit's in you, and that all happens when you just say yes. Oh, then your works, your fruit, follow. You see, you don't clean it up by putting stuff in. It gets cleaned up by Christ coming in, and then he cleans it up from the inside out. And then all of a sudden, Nate starts asking, like, Nate, woo! You had a perfect son, except I know I'm lying, because when your son was born, he was the sinner. So how do you get to where he's perfect? Jesus. 
And he's not perfect, but in his stand, he's perfect, but he's getting better. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the Christ in us. We don't profess it. We possess him. He possesses us. That's what I call the big yes. My time is up. We're going to celebrate communion. Except there might be somebody here. You've never, ever received him. You know about him. You profess him. But you never possessed him. Father, thank you for your word today. And your protection, Lord, of our church for 34 years. Your Holy Spirit and godly men and women, Lord, that have walked through the decades just trying to love people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And the few times we've had false prophets here, Lord, you have protected us. And I thank you for the authority of your word. Pray for a lot of our friends, Lord, that are still out there that for whatever reason, not that coming to this church makes it, I'm not saying that, they, they've left Jesus, they have left the Bible. The, we pray for them today. The truth that they heard years ago, Lord, you're able to communicate that again. And so we pray for them. Thank you for communion, the chance we have to remember the body and the blood of Jesus, your son, your love that was poured out to us, Lord, on that tree. We not only confess that, but we receive it. Thank you for the day when it went from my head down into my heart, when you saved me. And it could be that you sat through this whole sermon with whatever thoughts and you never got rebuked by the Lord to the, the very last point. You thought you were good until we got to that part about professing versus possessing. And I'm not trying to rebuke anybody. I'm just trying to say you need to have Christ in you. The hope of glory. At some point in time, you've got to be man enough or woman enough to say, I need Jesus within. I need to be saved. Before we take communion together. If that's you, I mean, you're just sitting there and it's like the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart. And you know you need to be connected to Christ. Whether it's the first time or you're rededicating, I don't really care. The fact that you need to be connected to Christ. I'm going to ask you to stand. If there's anybody in this room that you know you've been professing but not possessing, you need Christ. You need Christ. Like right now. Is there anybody, just by standing, I'll just pray for you before we have his table. Thank you, my friend. Anybody else? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother, way in the back. Thank you. Thank you, brother, back over here. Thank you, thank you. Lord Jesus, we pray, not just for the ones that are standing, we pray for all of us, Lord. Thank you that we do have a chance to confess you with our mouths, to make a public statement, Lord. And so for these that are standing, of course we pray for them and that connection, that connection between Jesus Christ and themselves, their heart, their soul, the Holy Spirit that somehow invades our lives and I know when that happened to me, and I pray, Lord, for these that stand, possibly some on radio, Lord, and others that maybe they're still seated. And it's not the position, it's the heart. So I thank you for salvation. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you, Lord, for what you did with your son as he took my place, our place, on that tree. As these that stand, Lord, turn from their sins and trust you and confess you with their mouths, 
Just today, I pray that you would speak to them in a very personal way. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open their eyes to biblical truth they've never seen before, and that that new creature, that new man, that new woman inside. Oh, Lord, I thank you for salvation. Thank you for Grace Church. We give this time of communion to you, Lord. May we not do it too quickly as we remember the hero of our faith, the Lord Jesus himself. May he receive all honor and glory. He's the only one that's worthy, and God's people would say. You guys want to thank the ones that would stand? And... As we pass out the elements of the Lord's table, please hold on to them. Tell everybody has been served, and we can partake together in just a moment. It's absolutely amazing that that piece of bread that you hold in your hand that represents the body of our Lord Jesus. And we are commanded to remember him, to remember his body. That, that God, the word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The incarnation, I believe in the incarnation, the Christmas story, absolutely believe that. That God became a man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus, in a body, just like yours, just like me, so he could die. See, God can't die unless he becomes a man, so that he could be our substitute. That's the gospel, that's the good news. He's, he's my substitute, God is my substitute, the God-man, the Lord Jesus. And that's what we remember when we come to his body. He died for me on that tree. And then a new covenant in his blood, a new covenant. Oh, this takes the place of the old covenant. This is the new covenant in his blood. You see, this represents the very, very blood of God who, who bled out. He bled out for my sin. Not just to cover it, to remove it. To remove it. My Savior, the Lord Jesus, on that tree, died in my place, bled out for me so that I could be a son of God, that I can be a child of God, that I can go to heaven instead of hell, that my sins can be erased and forgotten. You know what that is? That's good news. That's good news. And in case we ever think it's about us or what we do, listen, that's why he say, remember me. Remember me. When you come together, remember me. This is all about Christ. And who we are in him. Amen? Enjoy him today. Enjoy him today. Not just right now, but I mean today. As you leave here, enjoy him. To the pure, all things are pure. Enjoy the Lord Jesus today. But never forget, the love of God was manifested completely at that cross at Calvary. God so loved you, he gave his only begotten son. Father, thank you for your son. I'm sure sometimes I say that way too quickly. I know I do. Thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did become flesh. And you drank of that cup so that by drinking of this I can remember the new covenant, Lord, in your blood, in your blood. And so we thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, how you remind us deeper and deeper and deeper of that unbelievable truth that God so loved us he gave his son. We thank you for the gospel that we can possess it, Lord. Pray that Jesus receive the honor and glory and that we would remember and be encouraged and new energy to face another day. Even so, come Lord Jesus would be my prayer. God's people would say, Amen. enjoy the Lord, enjoy him.
I love you guys. Love you. You've been very patient. And the Lord is good. And um, we're just going to let you be dismissed. The worship team is going to sing another song, but you can stay as long as you like. The Lord is good. Enjoy Jesus today.